privilege to welcome on behalf of one of the co-hosting organizations, Citizens for Global Solutions. My name is Rebecca Schutt. I am the executive director. Um, and before we get started, I'll acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the ancestral and unceded land of the Anacostan people, despite the magic of Zoom making it possible for so many of us to meet in varied and multitudinous ways. So you're joining us for the first book club installation for Keep Hope Alive. Let's see. If this want to make sure this is not blurry. Okay, there we go. Essays for a War-Free World with its author, the Honorable Douglas Roche, who will be introduced by my colleague at further length in a moment. Um, the book club is one of Citizens for Global Solutions flagship programs, it's our longest standing program. And through a series of conversations with authors, we probe topics related to democratic world federalism. And this is the first time that we are delighted to partner with one of our fellow member organizations of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, the World Federalist Movement Canada. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to my colleague and counterpart and dear friend, Alex Nagaisik, in just a moment. Um, I will say for those of you who are joining us for the first time, although I see many familiar faces, that uh, Citizens for Global Solutions is a longstanding organization having been founded in 1947 as the World Federalist Association. Um, over time, we have had the privilege to further many of the causes that we read about in this book uh, in partnership with friends all across the world. Um, and of course, um, Honorable Roche has been a leader on disarmament and peace issues uh, north of the border while we have been working assiduously in the United States as the United States member organization of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, having been founded by eminences including Einstein, uh, William Fulbright, Norman Cousins, um, and having a close connection um, to uh, Oppenheimer himself. I see many of you will probably be watching the Oscars tomorrow, and we are delighted that that this issue is back in the public consciousness when perhaps it had receded uh, and unfortunate that it took popular media to bring us there. Um, but um, we hope that the engagement that we have today in book club will be furthered through uh, uh, coherent and concrete action on a policy level. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. I think many of those on the call have um, contributed, in addition to, of course, our esteemed guest, um, have contributed to furthering policies that um, uh, give action to the, the words and sentiments included in this book. Um, so with that, I will pass uh, the mic to my colleague, Alex Big Isaac, uh, the Executive Director of World Federalist Movement Canada. Hi, thank you, Rebecca. Um... So I'm Alexander McIsaac. I'm the executive director of WFM Canada. Uh, we're very happy to be collaborating with CGS uh, on this book club. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to go over um, the right honorable or the honorable Douglas Roche's uh, bio. I'm sure uh, we've all read it in the book and we, a lot of us actually know Douglas Roche for his uh, avid work in world federalist uh, projects. So Honorable Douglas Roche is a former senator, member of parliament, Canadian ambassador for disarmament, and visiting professor at the University of Alberta. He was elected chairman of the United Nations Disarmament Committee at the 43rd General Assembly in 1988. His previous books include The Human Right to Peace and The United Nations in the 21st Century. He holds nine honorary doctorates. In 2018, the International Peace Bureau awarded him the prestigious Sean McBride Prize for his indefatigable work, in particular as president of the UN Association. As ambassador for disarmament during the height of the Cold War, he helped maintain strong Canadian public support for the ideals of multilateralism in one of the most turbulent times in modern history. In 2010, the city of Hiroshima named him an honorary citizen for his nuclear disarmament work and for founding the Middle Powers Initiative. In 2009, he received the Distinguished Service Award for the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians for his promotion of human welfare, uh, human rights, and parliamentary democracy in Canada and abroad. So just to add to this list as well, um, as we all know, Douglas Roche is an avid supporter of World Federalist Projects, and he was our esteemed guest speaker at our 2023 World Federalist Conference, 
where he presented on a war-free world. With that, I will pass it off to you, James. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Alex, yeah. Um, so first of all, um, I'm James May, uh, today's moderator. Um, I'm CGS prog uh, program officer. First of all, also let me uh, apologize for the in incorrect link uh, sent out on Friday and uh, thank Drea for picking that up and correcting it earlier. Um, Drea is monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to her in the chat. Um, we're recording today's session and it will be available on CGS's YouTube uh, channel by the middle of next week. To ensure there's enough time for everybody to ask questions, I'm going to set a community agreement and ask that you keep your questions and comments to just two minutes, please. Um, if you go over that time, I'll interject and remind you uh, of the time limit um, so that everybody has an opportunity to speak. I will also ask you uh, to limit yourself to just one question per person um, or one comment per person. Does anybody uh, object to the community agreement or can we move on? Okay. Um, so the Honourable Roach will uh, uh, kick us off with uh, his thoughts and essays covered in today's session, that's parts one to three of the book. Uh, we will then open up for questions at around 12.40. You can register, uh, you can raise your, your uh, hand physically or virtually if you'd like to ask a question, or you can put it in the chat box. Um, we'll go to people on a first come first serve basis. We'll stop about 10 minutes before the end of the session. That's around uh, one twenty ET. Um, for any announcements that you might have uh, on other issues that you'd like to promote to other members of the book club. So I would ask you just to keep any off topic questions to the end of the session. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Honorable Douglas Roach. Today's our first section test session and um, I'm glad to hand over you to. Well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, he hello to uh, everyone. I have I see some uh, new, new friends in uh, the group today, and uh, some old friends, and uh, particularly my dear, highly respected colleague of so many ventures we did around the world together, Alan Ware. It's it's a, it's a great it's a great honor for me to be with uh, this distinguished group today. So thank you very much for this invitation. Now, um, I would like to uh, have the have, have everyone have the benefit of, of uh, more the most time possible in a question and answer session because I think you think it's undoubtedly going to be a challenging discussion that we will have. So let me keep my opening comments as brief as a, as is reasonable here. I'm going to make three main points. First is that uh, two great themes are crashing together in, in this moment, this turbulent moment in, in world history. Uh, the first is that humanity is calling out for survival. Uh, we see that in the uh, pleas for greater implementation of human rights, uh, see it in the struggle to meet the challenges of global warming so that our world does not literally burn up. Uh, we see it in economic and social development, the poverty, the migration of peoples, the quest for peace, um, highly dramatic and suffering terms today. This is a great surge that humanity is experiencing in seeking its own survival. Against that is the second great theme that has emerged, and that is the return to militarism. Militarism is on the rise. Uh, the promise of more wars is on the horizon. The suffering already today in the Ukraine, uh, Russia, Ukraine war, the Israel, Gaza war, uh, wars elsewhere that are now being shoved aside because of the dramatic nature of what is going on in the Middle East and in Ukraine. 
$2.2 trillion is that being spent on arms by nations, the highest figure ever. And so this return to militarism as the so-called route to peace is a consequence of the failure of the international system to project its own plans for human survival that emerged with the growth, the development and growth of the United Nations. So I do not mean, and I am not, those of you who know me know that I'm not an alarmist. I don't go around yelling fire all the time. But I've lived a long life. Uh, I was uh, 16 years old when World War II ended. So I lived through World War II. And I have uh, not felt as so deeply concerned for the what I would call the whole struggle for humanity in my lifetime, as I feel now, when we're having a loss of faith and hope particularly in the United Nations. And that brings me to my second point in this introduction. We must find a way to revive the United Nations as the centerpiece of peace and security in the world. I remind you that it was in the darkest days of World War II, World War II following World War I, it consumed 100 million lives. That truly was a culture of war that prevailed in 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 the last in the last century. The the uh, Roosevelt and Churchill, that's the key players, did forge a way forward by getting the United Nations off and running in San Francisco in 1945. And with the charter, particularly the section that provides to the Security Council the responsibility for peace and security in the world, uh, we saw a moment of real hope for the world that maybe we would be able to stop having wars. Well, we all know and we don't need to recite too long here, the tragedies of the reversion of the West away from putting its hope and strength, policy and money into the United Nations, into the revival on the Western part of NATO. And the enlargement of NATO, which took place over the intervening years, was, as, as has been rightfully called, the single biggest uh, political mistake in, in American history, the revival and strengthening and expansion of NATO. That was a challenge to the United Nations, which was supposed to be the arbiter of peace. So we've never been able to get past the veto, the problems of the veto system, I'll speak more about it later on. The, uh, but the United Nations, as a whole, has lifted the lives of countless people. I mean, millions, perhaps billions of people are alive today and have benefited from the agencies and programs of the United Nations over the years. And so let it not be said that because the United Nations is, doesn't seem to be able to stop the ongoing wars today, that we have to write off the United Nations and forget about it. And that, unfortunately, is a trend in Western politics to roll over the United Nations. Guterres, who is calling out for peace today and has issued the agenda for peace, his wonderful document, which has 12 points in, in, his, in his document, is, if it's not ignored, it is certainly downplayed or shoved aside in today's uh, tumult. And so, of course, the Security Council needs to be reformed. We all know that. And we need to have the addition of India, Brazil, and South Africa as at least three major important 
super important states added to the Security Council as permanent members. So we got to find out ways to revolve around the veto system. I'm calling here today for the deletion of the United Kingdom and France as permanent members. Some say that that's a stretch too far, but I noticed that some distinguished voices in the United Nations are now speaking this way. That's a Security Council that's presently composed, which is an outgrowth of World War II, cannot continue into the, all the challenges of the 21st century uh, with, uh, with any kind of proportional representation of peoples. In the meantime, we have the agenda for peace uh, the agenda for peace uh, needs to be given much more attention for its 12 points, uh, which start out by the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, and, uh, as, and as a guitarist says, until they are eliminated, a commitment, a, re a renewed commitment never to use them. The second, to boost preventive diplomacy in this era of divisions. US, use the UN good offices, develop prevention strategies. Well, that is the theme of the agenda for peace that is conjoined with the sustainable development goals that were inaugurated in 2015 as a 15 year program uh, to eradicate the worst forms of poverty in the world. Well, they built on the success of the Millennium Development Goals, which went from 2000 to 2015, which literally, which lifted literally millions of people out of poverty. And so, the 17 goals of the it, uh, of, in the Sustainable Development Goals program is itself a program for peace, and organized and uh, and uh, put in into into a formulation by by the United Nations. We should not forget that. Also now building up for the summit of the future to be held in the September of this year as a sort of place to project what we have learned about peace building, the work of the Peace Building Commission, uh, and projecting that forward into a common security agenda. That is where the United Nations is going. The United Nations is heading in its programs, in its proclamations, in its agencies, in its work for common security in which no person is secure in the world until all are secure or all are secure. We'll need everybody's security. So we must go across boundaries and must think in new ways of approaching the, the questions of security. Yeah. Well, now, this for me gives me a basis of my hope. I do not present myself here to you today as an optimist as such, as distinct from a pessimist, and we're all pessimistic in some ways. Optimism to me is too light a word for what I feel myself and what I'm trying to project, which is a, 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 a serious attempt to uh, recognize that out of the institutions that we have already built in the world, coming out of World War II, we do have a framework for peace. And what, what is needed is not, you know, putting our heads in the sand or, or, or bemoaning the fact that the UN is not strong enough or not in, not in its political dimensions, but to recognize that we in our own lives and we in, 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 the, in the Western world pushing our governments, we need to do more to um, recognize that what, what will carry us forward is the responsibility that each person has the responsibility for the, the continuation of God's creation on this planet. So I see hope as more than a blind assumption that things will turn out all right. A hope is best understood as a verb, connoting an active desire with the expectation of fulfillment. We long for something and will it to happen through our actions and the exertion of our actions. That very process generates hope and it weaves itself through the human condition. 
hope is rooted in our spirit and we dare not lose that spirit despite the adverse and depressing headlines of the day. I do not turn my back on all those who are suffering. I say, if we want, if we care about them, we must lift ourselves up to meet this new challenge, just as the challenges of World War II were met by the very creation of the United Nations. So the, there is millions of people, millions of people in civil society movements, in disarmament, development, environmental protection, civil rights, human rights, they have developed a global presence that stimulates, encourages, reprimands, and otherwise pressures governments to implement forward-minded global security policies. I feel this strength. I feel it strongly. I, 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 when I, I don't travel so much these days, but when, when I traveled around the world many times, I could feel it in all the beautiful places uh, in the world. I, 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 I feel it when I see the benefits of science, medicine, and technology. Um, I, I feel it when I, when I look into the, it in our extended family, we have a new baby, and this is a six weeks old baby. When I see this baby, I mean, it's just a challenge for me to see the beauty and development of the human being. Well, that's, I guess you might say why I really wrote this book. Because I feel that it's it's a, it's a time when we have to recognize more widely that we are we have a global conscience. We all we're all aware of the fact that we have a personal conscience to do you know, it tells you the difference between right and wrong. Because of the global world that we live in, and the inter interconnection of the trans border characterization of all problems this has given way to this has given us uh, a basis to develop this new agenda for peace that reaches out beyond ourselves and beyond the old militarism beyond the old culture of war to a new culture of peace the culture of peace is well has been well defined much of the work of the United Nations, not much of the work, but, but a, 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 a not inconsiderable part of the work of the United Nations has actually delineated the, uh, the, the culture of peace and gone on to establish, at least in documentary form that has been voted on, the right to peace. It's not seem to be, doesn't seem to be too well known that in 2016, the General Assembly did adopt a resolution called the right to peace. And I think that uh, the, the, uh, the, the the opponents of, of, of a right to peace uh, fear it uh, because um, uh, and, and object to it uh, because the fulfillment of the right to peace would be the abolition of war, made make war illegal. That, that that would mean the that's indeed the very idea of of the right to peace. And so those who are making money off of war, I. Uh, ask the military industrial complex to please take note of their own responsibility in this regard. These people who are making money off war do not want peace. So it's going to be a long struggle to get the right to peace fully, fully recognized and implemented. Nonetheless, that work has started. So that age, the age old questions of personal conduct, determining of moral life have given way to new questions about the well-being of citizens of the planet and the planet itself. So I think that uh, if we recognize that global conscience is a reality, even a phenomenon of the new age in which the planet has become our common home, this ought to animate us even more. So this is, uh, I close by just asking you to take one second about this envision, this panoramic world, this beautiful world that I've traveled around so much in. It's, it's still being developed by knowing and caring people. It's, it, huge challenges, but the energization of, of our, ourselves in injecting ourselves more into the continued development of the, of the world is a basis of hope. Hope indeed is how we survive. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Douglas. I would now like to open the floor to questions. Um, lots of applause there. Um, you can raise your virtual hand, you can raise your physical hand, or you can put a question in the chat where uh, Drea will bring it to our attention. So uh, the first raised hand I see is by Tad in Los Angeles. So would you like to kick us off, please? Thank you, James. Uh, hello, Senator Roche. Um, hello, it's Tad. been many years since I've seen you in person or even online, and it, this is a real joy. Uh, and I just would like to say, <laughs> Your oratorical prowess remains wholly undiminished. <laughs> Those were remarkably elevating remarks, uh, Doug, and I, I'm delighted to see that. So I have a very specific question for you. Uh, you recall, I hope, that you and I met just about 25 years ago when I was working for uh, former U.S. Senator Alan Cranston. Um, and as I know you know, uh, he was a former president of this organization. Citizens for Global Solutions back uh, at the dawn of this organization. And I think it's fair to say that the central proposition, it's not the only thing that we're about, but the central proposition that this organization has been about since its founding is that there is one and only one solution to the problem of war, and that is a world state, a world republic, uh, a world federation. With that preamble, I want to remind you that you, me, Alan Ware, and Alan Cranston, and a lot of other people have devoted a lot of our professional attentions uh, to the abolition of nuclear weapons. I don't want to call that a lesser goal than the abolition of war, but it's sort of a subset goal. And so that is my question for you, Doug, is can we envision the abolition of nuclear weapons which would be a huge transformation of the human condition and eliminate this specter of literally an extinction inducing apocalypse that has haunted us since 1945. Can we envision humanity bringing that about before something like a world federation, before the full dawn of a federal Republic of Earth? Well, thank you, Tad. Uh, thank you. Um, you opened up a challenging, what I call it, dual set of issues in here. And uh, thank you for also for mentioning the great uh, Senator Alan Cranston. I knew him pretty well. And uh, he, his, uh, his, his vision was something that we, we all ought to emulate. Um, now, I would like to be very careful here that I'm not misunderstood. Um, this is a an audience of world federalists, and I consider myself in that same group. We want uh, be brief about it. I mean, a world federation would lead to a one one government, but we're living in a time when the governments and systems are competing, and so best we can get right now is cooperation uh, to replace the existing confrontation. But you predicated that as a necessary uh, a necessary thing to, to obtain in order to get the abolition of nuclear weapons. I said I wanted to be careful because I do stand for world federalism. And I also stand for the abolition of nuclear weapons. But I think that there can be no peace in the world until the nuclear weapons are eliminated. They are the fundament they are a fundamental challenge to the development of the peace agenda. And there are treaties in existence now, the non-proliferation treaty, certainly as the essential multilateral instrument by which all states have undertaken under Article 6 to 
uh, enter into comprehensive negotiations for the elimination of nuclear weapons, uh, and a, a, a demand, uh, a requirement that has been reinforced by the International Court of Justice. They're not doing that. And thus, it, as world conditions deteriorated and the modernization of nuclear weapons expanded over the past 15, 20 years, the humanitarian movement arose, a great humanitarian movement based largely on civil society, although with some forward-minded governments joining them. And out of that came the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, 2017. It's now been ratified by some 70 countries. So these are, of course, it's challenged. The treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons is heavily challenged by the nuclear weapon states, and particularly by NATO, because it counters the military doctrine of nuclear deterrence, which is the basis for the continuation of nuclear weapons by the nuclear weapon states. So for me, I cannot wait until the all the political developments that are necessary to bring us to a, the fullness of World Federation, starting, for example, with a parliamentary association or a world parliament, some, some facet of a world parliament as a step toward a, a greater governance of the world. I cannot wait for the fulfillment of the political developments that will produce a government or even a set of governments uh, that will assure us peace. The situation, I, I, I consider the presence and, the, and now, of course, the threat to use nuclear weapons in the Ukraine war is so grave that I cannot take my eye off of the continued work, and I would say the continued need for escalated work uh, to uh, reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons. And thus, I want to speak strongly here for uh, all those who want to have world federalism and who want to have a world that is that is governed in a, in a more just uh, way, uh, with social justice as, as a basis, uh, to remember that we're never going to get there if nuclear weapons continue. So we've got to we've got to find a way to to defuse their political importance. We've got to shove them aside on the way to elimination, not allow the, them to be such a threat to to the modern world. It, caught up in its present wars. So I think I'll stop my answer there. And I, I, I'd, I'd like to, I hope I hope I have been, I hope I have been correctly understood here as, as wanting world federalism and wanting nuclear abolition even more. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Joseph, you raised your hand. Would you like to follow up? You just need to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, you did it, and then you un then you muted again. Don't unmute me, please. You, no, no, you're 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 unmuted. You're unmuted. Yeah. You can go. Um, well, Senator Roach, uh, thank you very much for your book and for uh, your analysis and your hope. Uh, I might follow up uh, Tad Daly's question uh, just with a uh, mention that um, one of the biggest steps toward nuclear uh, weapons abolition was the co comprehensive test ban. And the last time I checked it, uh, there were something like 150 parties to the nuclear test ban, the uh, comprehensive test ban. But... Uh, the nine nuclear weapon states are not parties, and there are two or three more that are not parties. 
And we seem to be simply stuck at this point of paralysis in the movement to abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, also, the treaties that ended the Cold War, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons Treaty, the Comprehensive uh, uh, Forces Treaty in Europe, and this now, even now the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty have all been abrogated. Uh, the international laws that might limit use of nuclear weapons uh, have been uh, abrogated. I'd like to ask you a question about something you wrote on page 20 of your book. Um, what was very helpful to me about the book was that you've updated so many developments in the United Nations, especially the um, the, uh, the comprehensive um, development goals, the CDZ, the CDGs, if I have that right. There's 17 of them. And uh, that's quite an eloquent pre presentation of how these uh, strategic development goals um, uh, were established after the millennial development goals. And there's been a, a slow movement by economists uh, to, uh, to um, come to grips with our global problems in the form of these 17 strategic development goals. But you report that, um, especially after the COVID pandemic, why um, there has been backsliding on the, C on the uh, S SDGs. Um, and I've, I've heard that uh, in anticipation of the, uh, of the uh, summit on the, on the future uh, in September, why the uh, group of 77 and the developing countries are almost opposing any further reforms in the UN, uh, lest uh, attention be diverted from the strategic development goals. But on page 20, you uh, say something that I found absolutely wonderful from a World Federalist point of view. Um, you point out that um, Secretary General Guterres has proposed a new social contract to make the a reality of the strategic development goals. And uh, for the Secretary General to invoke the uh, political philosophy of uh, a, a new of a social contract implies that there would be some step taken toward uh, a representative state, uh, even like that of the United States or France, do you think that that proposal could possibly develop, that there could be maybe a, some kind of an institution established within the General Assembly that would uh, enforce this, the SDGs and, and move us one step toward uh, a world state, as Tad was saying. Thank you, Joseph. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, your question is, uh, Joseph, is very, uh, very, very profound indeed. Um, uh, look, before I get to the SDGs in your question, you, you did mention the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and, and, the, and the, the difficulty it has had in coming into force. Um, there's about six to eight countries that are still required under the terms of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty to ratify it before it comes into force. The United States is preeminent in that list of countries whose uh, ratification is requisite. And uh, the United States tried uh, under the Clinton administration, and uh, I think it was 1998. Uh, as a matter of fact, the United States was the first country to sign the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And, uh, but when it came up to the Senate, it went down uh, because it was uh, interjected with other issues and so on. And the deterioration of arms control agreements began at that point and accelerated in 2000 when George W. Bush came into power and uh, abrogated the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and uh, turned its back on the commitments made 
by the United States at the 2000 review of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which adopted 13 practical steps, which included the CTP as, 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 as a four, four piece. And so the deterioration and then the disruption and the elimination of multiple tr successive treaties has taken place up to this present moment. And it is that loss of uh, legal structure to uh, carry on the work of nuclear disarmament that is itself so alarming today. And that is why the continued failure of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to achieve any kind of uh, meaningful agreement, uh, it, got, it operates on, a, on, a, on an outmoded system of, of consensus, meaning any one state can, 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 up, can upset the progress. So there are mechanistic reasons that are also involved in this. But what has generally taken place is a loss of faith in institutions and the legal basis for the, for the protection of our peoples. And so it's in this atmosphere that the, we now have to look at the uh, uh, proposal by the Secretary General for a new social contract, which he said, uh, which he he, he envisioned uh, that uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement on climate change and, and the agreements on uh, the financial mechanisms uh, chiefly administered by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, uh, that all of that could be put into a, a new social contract between governments, people, civil society, and business to integrate employment opportunities, sustainable development, and social protection based on equal rights and opportunities for all. Well, of course, this is, this is, this is a, 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 an ideal uh, and a basis uh, for, for um, uh, hard uh, political work, uh, but it requires an atmosphere uh, that would be more conducive to the development of the energy for this work. In other words, the political system itself is falling apart today. And it's uh, one, one is always tempted, to, at least internationally speaking, tempted to point the finger at the United States. And it's, it's, we might get to the United States a little bit later in this program, but uh, I, I, I think the problem is, of course, that, that uh, that we're talking about here, namely it's building up, up legal enforcement uh, to protect peoples and advance human development, is a problem that is far far greater than the, far greater than the United States, although the United States plays a very important role in it. So, can the Mr. Guterres' uh, uh, hope or his aspiration for a new social contract uh, be implemented? It's a tough today, but I would I would sort of take it in stages. If we can't have a whole social contract, then could we at least have uh, more, uh, a full fledged involvement in the in the seventeen programs uh, involved in the Sustainable Development Goals? This this in, this involves a, a, a range of issues: of the water, agriculture health, education, there's a range of issues that are at the heart of building uh, uh, building the human security agenda. And so we ought to be able to agree on that because for highly pragmatic reasons, and namely to stabilize the world and stop the necessity of uh, huge migrations, the migrations of peoples that are now becoming a hallmark of the modern world and that show the suffering and the delusion of of of, 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 of the, the people that that uh, that think that we can that we could keep borders the it will strengthen the border they say it'll keep people out well uh, it's uh, it, 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 we've gone past that in in world history and so we have to recognize that no nation can live unto itself and and that all the problems are interconnected, and 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 the very idea of 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 of, of modern life is an international is must be in, internationally based because of all the factors that, that are involved. 
So to so, to to conclude this answer to to your very very important question, um, I think that uh, uh, guitarists should keep uh, uh, the aspiration for a new social contract very much on the table, but he should keep driving the governments to push for the sustainable development goals, and um, and uh, the and and con, and conjoined to that, increased work. Uh, for the elimination of nuclear weapons, uh, because the 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 threat to uh, continued life on this planet is based the, the threat is based on the on the on the uh, on the threat of of of, of, uh, of uh, obliteration in in huge areas of the world by an active use of a nuclear weapon. Or the threat of the hurt, uh, hurting hurting the world, the, the world's ability to continue through climate change, through the inability of peoples to live in in growing numbers, uh, uh, in the growing areas of the world, uh, the threat of pandemics. All of that calls for a a more, if not unified, at at the very least, cooperative. Cooperation in the name of of common survival, that is a pragmatic program, that should be the at the forefront of political activity today, while keeping in mind that a social contract would be in a, a goal that we would try to reach through more development of the right to peace itself. Thank you, Douglas. Um, I will go next to Alan, if you wouldn't mind, and then we'll come to Jacopo once we've heard the answer. Alan, take it away. Oh, can we have Jacopo first? I think it's quite good to have a younger voice, uh, so that's why I'd, I'd prefer to go after Jacopo. In that case, Jacopo, would you like to take us on? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, Senator Rhodes, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, it's an honor to have the opportunity to participate in this dialogue with you. Um, I was just wondering, I, I just noticed that um, on page 66, you lay out like 10 steps to peace or uh, 10 concrete steps that you envision are necessary to foster in a, cult a culture of peace. I noticed that like step number nine um, is peace education. And um, you, know, you mentioned courses in conflict prevention, conflict resolution. Um, and I was wondering, do you... Do you do you feel that peace education should be more comprehensive than just like a separate program dedicated to peace studies? Like that, in other words, that like peace building and a peace perspective should be integrated into like all courses, including economics, political science, sociology, and psychology, even at the high school level and college and post grad. But I I just feel like the way like courses are taught is that like you know for example economics economic efficiency is like the standard. For example, like, you know, the measuring point, I guess you could say. Um, whereas, like, I feel like a lot of these courses, especially like political science, for example, don't really cover um, peace building topics and how to foster a culture of peace within their respective disciplines. So then people with these degrees go on and they might be advocating for policies like economic policies or interacting with their uh, politicians across with their fellow politicians across the aisle in a way that is not conducive to peace building. So do you feel like peace education should be more comprehensive than it is now to really foster a culture of peace? Or I know it's not really related to world federalism, but I was just wondering like on your perspective regarding peace education. Well, uh, thank you very much. My short answer to you is yes. Uh, I do feel that uh, peace education uh, needs to be integrated into uh, systems of, of education. Um, uh, for a considerable number of years, I taught as a visiting professor at the University of Alberta, and I taught a 400-level course, that is to say, for seniors, senior undergraduates and first-year under first-year graduates. Uh, a 400-level course on titled "War or Peace in the 21st Century?" Question mark. And I always told the students to pay attention to the question mark because they would have to decide whether to remove the question mark or not, whether it was war or peace in the 21st century. 
So that was a very humble, modest effort uh, on my own part to uh, in, it, it introduce uh, peace education into a university for, for faculty. And this, this was a credit course, and it, it was very popular. And of course, I, I held it to 20 students at a time in a, in a seminar, a three-hour seminar. So that's just one small little little anecdote of 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 the of the of the need to uh, to foster uh, peace education, which I see seriously delinquent on the educational file writ large. I'm not an expert in what is now being taught in in grammar schools or elementary schools and high schools programs, although I visit them time to time. But I do think mm -hmm. that. Um, there is insufficient attention paid uh, by the, uh, th those who are in charge of the curricula uh, to to introduce the peace subjects, and and, they, and of course they consider this too political, and in, a, in the increasing polarization of our society, uh, parents are wary of what their children are being taught, and one from one phase or another, and so there is a lot of complications involved in this. But certainly, uh, the the thrust of your question and the thrust of my answer is that there needs to be far more enlightenment uh, generated throughout our society through higher standards of education of people for what is involved in living a peaceful life. So it's uh, I do not I do not want to hear here to underplay or underestimate the need of education uh, to also prepare prepare students for the working world and uh, I'm very conscious of that but uh, but but the 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 first and foremost purpose of education is to is to help help a human being to discover his and her own humanity and the full full development of the person and the full development of the person means how we reach out to one another, and particularly in a world that is challenged for our very continued survival by issues of climate, and weaponry, and poverty, economic and social, and so on. And so what can I do but say we need to have more of it and, uh, and get our politicians to recognize the need of it uh, without without having such issue such issues that we are discussing here uh, deteriorate into a partisan part a, a partisan presentation of facts. Thank you, um, Alan. Would you like to come on board next? Thank you very much, James. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Alan Ware, uh, Program Director for the World Federalist Movement and the Global Coordinator for Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. A role I have thanks to Doug, who was the founding chair of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, and asked me to help set up this network. So it's wonderful to see you again, Doug, after these many years of working together on a range of these issues. Um, I'm actually very happy that I've come after Jacopo, because before I ask my question of Doug, I just want to uh, do one more follow up to his wonderful response to Jacopo. Because uh, my first career was as a teacher, uh, so I taught in kindergartens, primary and secondary schools and helped our government in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, develop the peace studies uh, guidelines for bringing peace studies into the curriculum. And we have it at all levels. So we have peace studies in kindergarten, in primary and in secondary. It's done in a very, uh, it's done in a, 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 a the way that Doug was talking about peace education as ways of helping people to be able to find peace in their lives through bringing solutions that that will work for them and engaging them as actors and and that's in a sense less controversial than than a political approach which would be going for a certain policy so it is possible to get peace studies into the curriculum uh, in a non-controversial way that is following up with the proper methodology um, of education uh, and it said we have that example in new zealand now to turn to doug and again um i think doug is this your 24th book and each one is incredible. And each one, I, I haven't read all of this one yet, I must admit. I've only got the, through the first few chapters. But every time I read your books, I, I'm always like, mm, my understanding of these issues is enhanced and new and fresh ideas are come up and it's wonderful. So thank you again for this incredible contribution. 
Um, if James permits me, I'd like to ask two questions. Uh, the first one is this interrelation between global governance, a peace, and nuclear disarmament. And I think you answered this beautifully, the question, you know, which one comes first? It's like the chicken and the egg, you know, they, they, and, and your answer was good. You know, they, they go together. It's not, you know, we, we have to have nuclear disarmament before we can have global governance, or we have to have a, a world government before we have nuclear disarmament. Progress on each of these is going to be complementary. But how we do, do we do that? You mentioned the issue of nuclear weapons being relied on so much still and very much alive. The risks are high. 42 countries, I think 43, are relying on nuclear weapons, the nuclear armed states and the allies. How do we shift them away from that reliance on nuclear deterrence? The humanitarian initiative hasn't really moved them. They haven't joined the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Would it, and but in your book, you write, raise the issue of common security, which I think holds part of the answer because the nuclear weapon states and allies rely on nuclear deterrence because they believe it provides security. So if you just take them away, they're not going to, they're going to resist. But if you provide an alternative security, that then provides a possibility. So I want to ask you, Doug, can you ex expand a little bit more on that? How can common security replace nuclear deterrence? And what about in the common security mechanisms, does the International Court of Justice play an important role as being a key legal mechanism for helping resolve conflicts and generate security without the relying on nuclear deterrence? And then my second question relies to where you talk a little bit about Boutros Boutros Ghali trying to bring in some innovative reforms of the UN and basically didn't get a second term as a Secretary General before that. And then you talk about Antonio Guterres is trying to bring in some good reforms. How can we make sure that the reforms that leaders we have, whether it be the UN Secretary General him or herself um, or other um, like-minded governments, that they don't get dropped and squashed by the powerful countries? Do parliamentarians play a critical role to ensure that these good ideas that are coming forward, these proposals for reform, and a lot of them are coming in for the UN Summit of the future, um, to make sure they don't get squashed? What role can parliamentarians play to, to help these be taken forward? Thank you. Well, Alan, as usual, you take my breath away. Your, uh, your wide scope, the, uh, reflecting the mind that you have and your own, and your own commitments. And uh, I, I recall with pleasure and amazement all the things that, that we did for so for so many years. And I have certainly been the beneficiary of your constant, never-ending drive. So, on common security, um, common security challenges uh, nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence is uh, run by the, just to, to recap on it, uh, the threat, the threat. I, I, I have the ability to respond to a nuclear attack that you were going to make on me. And if, therefore, I have to keep my nuclear weapon. Weapons, because I don't trust that you, you will ever. And it's it this modernization of nuclear weapons in which we see them being carried forward for the rest of this century unless there's some sort of break or halt put on them. And this comes out of the structures and power structures of the world. And we are living in, this colonialism is supposed to have gone away, but we're still living in a colonialist mentality in which the powerful states are exerting their power over the, over the, non-powerful or the less powerful states and nuclear weapons have become the currency of their power and so are we dealing here with just machinery or are we dealing here with the ideas that permeate the human mind and have for centuries 
this is a question that you've wrestled with and I have and uh, a lot of our colleagues about how we get rid of the mentality that says we have to have continu continuation of nuclear weapons for, for our own protection, or as NATO puts it in a very bold way, uh, for our supreme security, supreme guarantee of our security. The best way that I've been able to deal with, to reconcile these two great streams of thought, you know, nuclear weapons, the nuclear deterrence, and the abolition of nuclear weapons, is to try to work at the problem in a coherent, pragmatic manner. And thus, the, uh, the need to fulfill the non-proliferation treaty, which is still standing, at least in the world, uh, by fulfilling its obligation for comprehensive negotiations toward the elimination of nuclear weapons, even if that cannot be uh, fully uh, achieved I mean, to, get, to get down to zero, the very effort, Alan, the very effort uh, of, that we push the states to continue the process, uh, the continue the process they were on, of uh, some treaties to confine or rein in nuclear weapons, stop them from spreading so widely, and with the deeper consciousness that of reducing and then eliminating the nu nuclear weapons uh, and the recognition that the only safety we will ever have is without nuclear weapons to, to, to implement this now truism and uh, to recognize that what they now say is the inadmissibility of the, of the use of nuclear weapons must be turned into a, uh, into a program that would reduce uh, the, the 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 actual numbers uh, and implementation of uh, the legal obligation to uh, to engage in comprehensive negotiations toward their elimination. Those of us who believe in in in, in governance and governance and the world and, and having a government and have, having a way in which humanity can live and work together in in a in a more peaceful world. Those of us who, who, which means everybody on this program and, and all our colleagues, uh, we cannot we cannot cease, for one moment, pressing our governments to fulfill their obligations to toward negotiation toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. In other words, we cannot let the elimination of nuclear weapons drop off the table just because there's horrendous things taking place in the world today that seem to occupy our attention. So uh, we've got to move toward a common security in, in, in a very pragmatic manner. Common security it, it, it can be considered a, a nice spiritual ideal in which we would live more as a unified world under all, all God's children in, in one under under one umbrella, so to speak. But it's far far more than that now because we know that to that idea of theology has been conjoined a highly um, highly uh, pragmatic horizontal intersection. Of, of the ideas of um, the vertical ideas of theology coming down to us through the ages that we have to love one another conjoined to a pragmatic horizontal line of which we if we do not do this we're not going to survive so the very idea of survival today in the world has got to be brought for be brought forward and thus lead to more political action and that will be a very serious set toward common security on the International Court of Justice, it's now coming back a little bit into its own. It has been it has, it has been disregarded, as you know. When in 1998, the International Court of Justice ruled that, generally speaking, the use of nuclear weapons would contravene in all aspects of humanitarian law, and with one voice, they said the the International Court of Justice said that states have an obligation to to conclude, not just to pursue nuclear disarmament as, as they're called for under Article 6 of the NPT, but they have an obligation to conclude uh, uh, such negotiations. Well, those negotiations have not even started. So little regard do the major powers have for the ICJ. However, in this new incarnation, so to speak, in, uh, when, when the, inter the, uh, the uh, International Court of Justice has been, has been drawn into the climate question about the responsibilities for climate, and now also for the Gaza war, the 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 uh, the uh, excessive killings 
of uh, uh, it, I mean, how how can you, you really describe the, the 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 depravity of the of the killings that have uh, that, that take place as a result of the Gaza uh, the Hamas uh, invasion of uh, Israel and Israel's response the temperate uh, uh, disproportionate response at fault on both sides. So the International Court of Justice is is, is not root, it, it seized with, with ruling on uh, bringing an end to bringing an end to this war. So my point here is that the International Court of Justice having been written off or discard, disregarded for so long is now back in the forefront. And for me, the International Court of Justice is the is the uh, is a, is a sine qua non, so to speak. I mean, we have we have the International Court of Ju we have the International Criminal Court, but we al also need the International Court of Justice as 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 um, a, a medium by which we will live in in a legally protected way. I mean, to use this is a very very soft truism. I mean, if you go through a red light on the corner, a policeman arrests you, and you have to go to your local court. I mean, that's enforceable law. Internationally, we do not have enforceable law. So we have to build up that. And it certainly it is the work of the world federalists to keep pressing the development of, of, a, of, a, of, of enforceable international law and thus to promote the work of the ICJ as much as we can. On parliaments, well, just to find what you said about good parliaments, of course, uh, parliamentarians, that gets us into another dimension. The uh, the, the work of uh, parliamentarians, uh, members of Congress and, and so on, uh, this, uh, you know, here here we, I, I, I'll permit myself just to, Go just a bit further than perhaps is, is wise, but in, in, in this this gathering, you know, there's a lot of Americans here. Um, the uh, the American political system is 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 now dysfunctional, and it is a low regard and it, uh, for it. And, 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 and as a result of its dysfunction, it it is it is sort of fed, fed upon itself, and it produced this whole situation that we're now facing and the, the characterization of the opponent of, uh, of uh, the Biden regime. So the parliamentarians in other parts of the world have uh, li live in areas, not all, but live in areas where there is a higher regard and a higher capacity for their input into the construction of what I would call positive policies in, in moving forward. So parliamentarians writ large generally play an extremely important role in, in, in bringing their governments forward. And, and I have written in, about this in the past, about the, the need and what the role would be for a parliamentary assembly. So giving parliamentarians a stronger role in the decision-making processes uh, that produce public policies is essential in my view. And parliamentarian, parliamentarians need to be urged to go forward and to recognize that they do have a capacity themselves that they so often are, are unwilling to exercise uh, for, for, for the common good. So, I mean, this is a very large subject and I don't wish to appear simplistic in, in, in giving uh, a short answer because it's a, it's a lot of complications, but generally speaking, I would say that the par parliamentarians, if, if they would seize the moment, seize their own uh, uh, responsibility, seize their own medium uh, for communication and pressure, pressing going forward, uh, and, and not allow themselves uh, to be influenced by the military industrial complex, um, we would then have a sure route to the political decision-making process. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Rebecca, I saw you raised your hand at the end of that comment. Did you have something that you wanted to respond to, perhaps? Um, if David would forgive me, I, I do have just a couple of direct points. Thank you so much, David. I did see your hand up earlier. 
Um, on the role of parliamentarians, um, I just wanted to, to add that um, both Citizens for Global Solutions and the World Federal, uh, well, I shouldn't speak for you, but WFM Canada, um, are strong supporters, fervent supporters of a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. Furthermore, um, here domestically in the United States, we're very well aware that our US Congress um, is one of the very, very few non-member parliaments, non-member legislatures of the Interparliamentary Union. Um, there have been increasing efforts to rejoin and there uh, and these are advocacy uh, measures that we're taking here domestically. In fact, in just a couple of weeks on, on the margins of the Interparliamentary Union Assembly, we will have the launch of a the, the official launch of a campaign that speaks to one of uh, Honorable Roche's other comments that the world is burning, uh, the Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance. And so it is critical for us to have legislators as part of this process. Um, I would also add, um, I think I mentioned this to, to the Senator and on a side conversation at one point, but I'm, I'm greatly indebted for your leadership as well as at PNND, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation Disarmament, at Parliamentarians for Global Action. Um, I, I served for a number of years on the Secretariat, in addition to the leadership by Senator Markey, with whom we are pleased to partner here on several uh, initiatives related to nuclear non-proliferation, we also work with um, Representative McGovern, who is the only U.S. representative uh, who is a member of Parliamentarians for Global Action at the federal, the national level. Um, next, I'll just quickly go to the ICJ and mention that, and I think there's some links in the chat here, um, the World Federalist Movement, Institute for Global Policy, World Future Council, and Citizens for Global Solution, with a further support um uh seven participating organizations i think we gotta mute somebody sorry um and uh more than uh 60 contributing organizations has launched a campaign called legal alternatives to war law not war that seeks inter alia but first and foremost to promote the universality and effectiveness of the international court of justice just as the same way our organizations came together to uh, promote the international criminal court and really will it into being through the coalition for the icc among the uh, objectives of this campaign is getting more states to accept universal uh, compulsory jurisdiction, better use of advisory opinions. We currently see a novel case before the court on climate change um, and the responsibilities of states there too. We also see uh, three genocide cases before the court, perhaps a fourth, there's a little bit of an asterisk there, um, as well as greater resourcing of the ICJ. Um, and we've included in the chat some of the resources on previous ICJ decisions that have made a paramount difference in the, I think, nuclear ecosystem um, regarding nuclear test ban and uh, the legality of the use of the advisory opinion of 1996 and the uh, legality of the use of nu nuclear weapons. So these are not just matters for contemplation, but active issues that we're working on. And hopefully you have enough resources in the chat, which will be saved and shared with all, um, that if anybody wants to be actively involved, uh, you may do so. I'm sure I missed some things there. I also hope we can come back um, before the end of our chat to the next steps in the global governance processes that Honorable Roche has gestured to um, with the Millennium Development Goals, paving the way for the Sustainable Development Goals, the new Agenda for Peace, and now upcoming the Summit of the Future. Um, and perhaps Alan Ware and I can share a little bit about that, but I don't want to monopolize too much time. I'm sure I, I went over my mandated two minutes. Sorry, James. Close. Um... I'm aware that we've got five minutes left for this uh, open discussion um, on the schedule. So I will actually go to David just in case, uh, just to get your question or comment. And then maybe Douglas, you could continue from there. Would that be okay? Okay, David, take it away. Uh, Senator, Senator Roche, thank you so much for being with us today. I wish I could be in the room with you and shake your hand. I know Zoom from what you wrote is not your favorite way to, to interact with people, but I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom <laughs> with us. Uh, I, thank I, you so much. I, I, I uh, got over it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, so my, my question is about uh, the point you made on enforceable law. I work in an organization called World Service Authority that is drafting a, a treaty on world citizenship. 
uh, that world citizenship should be a recognized legal status for everyone everywhere. And that would mean that no matter uh, uh, where you were born or what other uh, local citizenship you may or may not have, your rights would be fully respected as a human being. Um, and on page 26 of your book, you say uh, people's human rights do not disappear because their homes do. So new laws must be formulated. So my question is really uh, what law or what global legal institutions do you envision uh, to protect the more and more uh, people on our planet who are living, living in vulnerable situations? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what a challenging question. And uh, <laughs> the moderator said we have five minutes left. Uh, the questions are, I'm going to do my best. I want to begin by uh, giving a shout out to uh, uh, Senator Markey, uh, his work, and not Markey alone. There were others in uh, the work with him in uh, introducing into the United States legislative process uh, uh, measures that would limit severely the use of nuclear weapons and leading to uh, leading to a process of, of negotiations. And that, of course, uh, is so, so much the work of the PNND, uh, which I want to again recognize as a, as, a, as a body of parliamentarians, along with parliamentarians for global action. Um, the parliament, there are parliamentarians who care. When I, because I was a parliamentarian myself for a long time, I had a long political career. I, 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 I allow myself to be, and I am, rather critical of politicians who don't measure up. Uh, of, of which there are far too many, which is one of the re which is a principal reason why we don't have a a a, 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 a legal structure that has been mandated by a legislative process to 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 produce and guarantee peace. So this is a huge, huge problem. That being said, there are there are parliamentarians who care and Alan and uh, and your colleagues, uh, I mean I want I, I just want to come in behind you strongly on this again. Um I, uh, on world citizens, I, I consider myself a world citizen. I am a world citizen. Uh, but I'm also I carry a Canadian passport. In order to go anywhere, to show anybody who I am, I have to have a passport. So uh, I, I, we haven't got, reached the stage of humanity where somebody can issue a statement, a, a certificate that says, you know, they're, they're a world citizen and you can travel, etc. In other words, the rise of humanity that has taken place in the last thousand years, particularly the last hundred years, and I hope it will continue to keep rising if we can avoid blowing up the place in the process. The rise of humanity is bringing us to a period when the nation state will 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 cease being the definitive measure by which we measure uh, who we are. Um, I I am a Canadian. I'm a, I take great pride in that. I'm a little mad at the government most of the time, but I mean, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm a Canadian. But I am a, I'm a I'm a human being. I am a world citizen. I care about people. I care about I mean, the, the woman in Bangladesh whose life I wrote about, the farmer in, in Kerala, the, the uh, communist labor leader in Venezuela. All of these people have influenced me immensely so that that that's the way I look about life. But I'm also a pragmatic politician and therefore I got to have a Canadian passport. So uh, how to get to uh, raise up to a world, to the legal recognition of a world citizen status, that may come, uh, who knows, uh, in the distant future, and the future will be built by those who are working today. So we work on the issues that we can touch, we can manage, we can push today to advance for tomorrow. Uh, I do not think that we should uh, make the best the enemy of the good. The best would be a world citizen, but the good would be taking our, our, our existing national citizenships and making more of them by pressuring, pressuring stronger, more strongly, the governments involved in the, in the making of, of, uh, of, of policies. So this is not exactly a new idea that I'm, I'm putting out here. I'm only saying that um, uh, as we come to a conclusion on this remarkable uh, morning. I mean, I'm so glad that I 
privilege to have this opportunity to share my book, to share my thoughts with you. I mean, it's just been such a, a respectful conversation and a meaningful one, and one one that is uh, that, that has moved me. The, 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 your very presence and the way you put those questions I mean, that has moved me deeply. So I think that we we want a better world, and we and and we need to hope for it. But we need to energize ourselves, and ener in energizing ourselves. I believe we should have that star, the, the vision, the star out there to guide us. Or, but we've got to take steps along the way in living in this murky, muddy uh, domain uh, that we inhabit now. It's messy. Uh, it's, 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 it's turbulent. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's got its, its inhuman aspects to it. It, and it's and it's, uh, it, it's it's mud wrestling in, in in some some things which which a lot of us find so distasteful, and getting to a harvest is going to require continued seeding and nourishing of the plants that you are putting in the ground. That's my philosophy, and it's the way I live. Thank you very much indeed for today. Well, may I thank you um, for such a thought-provoking, uh, challenging and compassionate discussion, um, for your long work, uh, years of work, for your um, time today, and of course, for your new book, which we've been dis discussing. Um, if there aren't any more questions directly or comments about the book that uh, chapters one to uh, sections one to three that we've been going through today, I will ask if there are any more comments, general or otherwise, uh, relating to uh, CGS, your chapters, or any points you wanted to raise, as we always do in the last few minutes of book club. So, does anybody have anything to add? I think Julia's hand is raised. Julia Morton Mars waving her hand. Um, Julia, I think you've got to unmute. Sorry. Hello, Doug. Such a long time. Hello, um, my New Zealand friend. Um, where have you disappeared? Can't see you on my screen. And hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm the founder of International School Peace Gardens for the young man asking about peace. We went to 18 million people around the world when we were going strong. We stopped in 19, in sorry, 2014. Most of us were too old and bad health. But I spoke to Derek Paul, Doug, the other day, and he's mulled over this now at 95 or whatever his wonderful age is. He said, first of all, there are four things for survival. No war. International cooperation, of which tourism is the major carrier of that and would love to take down all of all of the borders. You know, just take a piece of wool and start unraveling. That's my little bit added. Prevent climate change with every possible way that we can. And... Um, Change the Economy, which, of course, is his new and special book that he's written, Leap into an Evolutionary Economy. And it's now in its fifth edition, and he's very happy with it. Um, so, Professor Derek Paul, for those of you who do not know him, was one of the co-founders of Science for Peace. He's on Pugwash. He also um, ran the global issues projects of which I was honored to be part of with Helmut Burkhardt and Phyllis Crichton and the group here in Toronto. Um, I have two more comments, Doug. The gardens, you know, taught conflict resolution with everything we did. We taught peace, but we also had friendship benches in the peace garden. We had indigenous artifacts donated by the local people and they were put up a totem pole talking about the area. 
um, we had cumin, cumin. <laughs> The community was involved by being invited to any presentation. And some of the schools had the secondary school build a bridge that went across from the, from the elementary school to the other side of a water pond. So they focused their um, learning on water. My design was around fresh water, oceans, creature corridors for migrating creatures. And, and then I was asked to do a number of other projects, but the program that I, or the organization was the International Holistic Tourism Education Center. It's no longer up there and easy to find, but if you put my name in, you'll find too much. That's it, thank you for listening. Thank you, Julia. Douglas, I saw you making notes. Did you want to come back on anything there? No, no, I appreciate very much Julie and Martin Mars' continued work, and it's wonderful to hear from her again today. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca, you mentioned that you might come back at the end of the session with some other thoughts. Uh, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, well, I'm actually wondering, um, rather than my monopolized conversation, um, Alan, where um, would you like to say anything about uh, taking the next step forward from the Millennium Development Goals through the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the new Agenda for Peace, to now what we're currently working on, which is the Summit of the Future in Civil Society's uh, part therein, wherein you and I are, are working on peace and security specifically together. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. And uh, you probably do know that the UN uh, General Assembly has decided to hold a summit of the future in September of this year in order to advance multilateralism for the future, for a better future. Uh, and in that, there is engagement of civil society uh, feeding into the process. Uh, and this includes uh, interactions with the like with sorry with the facilitators of various processes for the summit, uh, the Pact for the Future, which will be adopted at the summit, and also a declaration for future generations, but also civil society coming up with their own documents. And one of the key ones is what's called the Interim People's Pact. And in that, we are putting forward um, two sets of, of uh, ideas. One, proposals which we think we could get traction at for adoption at the summit of the future or around that time. And two, more ambitious proposals of how to ensure we have better global governance uh, for peace, for the environment, for human rights, and for the future. So we're engaging a lot of that through Coalition for the UN We Need, and I put the link to that um, into the chat. Some of this is coalescing around the 2024 UN Civil Society Conference. There's an, a civil society conference usually every year, and the focus of this year will be on the summer of the future. And as Rebecca mentioned, some of us are taking leading roles in certain parts of it. Uh, so Rebecca and I are involved in the peace and security strand of this and are feeding a lot of these ideas we've been talking about, about better use of the International Court of Justice, you know, the Law Not War campaign, elimination of nuclear weapons, putting a goal, for, uh, for example, of the elimination of nuclear weapons by 2045, the 100th anniversary of the UN, no, you know, make it no later than that, in order to get, get political traction behind these ideas. So we encourage you to be involved in that. You can either do it through the CGS, uh, which is taking an active role, or you can do it independently and join the Coalition for the UN We Need process. Um, and if you, if you can't find that through the links in the chat, then just contact Rebecca or myself and we'll be able to help you become engaged. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Alan. I, I think it only remains for me to to thank everybody for your very, um, I think the word was generous, that was that Honorable Roche used, your generous contributions throughout uh, today's, this morning's event, as well as your continued support of CGS, WFM Canada, and WFM. Um, without your support, we could not have these programs. So again, there is a link in the chat to donate. Please, please do. I see many people who already do um, so that we can bring more of this programming to you. Um, and uh, if anybody needs links to the book at this point, I think you all have it, but please share widely with your family and friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, your colleagues. Um, we would love to uh, promote this book more widely. I know we're two minutes over time, so I hand back to our moderator. 
And then uh, um, Alex, sorry, Alex, would you like to say a word before we hand back to James for closing and practicalities? Uh, no, thank you very much for mentioning also and putting the link for Telefilm Canada in the chat. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, we will next convene on the 13th of April for the next session, um, which we look forward to. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you to the Honourable Douglas Roach for your time. It was an excellent hour and a half. Um, we hope the next one is as good. Thank you uh, thank, so much. Th thank, thank you all very much. It's been a wonderful, wonderful morning, and I, I wish you all the, all the best. Thank you very much.